Hello and welcome to Interview, a production of the Government Information Service. I am your host, Fernal Neptune. Today we'll focus on the topic, Surveillance for Coronavirus at Ports of Entry. And with us to discuss this topic is Chief Environmental Health Officer, Paco Ragnanan. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Ms. Neptune, and thanks for having me on your program this afternoon. Wonderful. As we look at the Department of Health and Wellness um, to focus on surveillance at the ports of entry, one of the areas is very important is the international health regulation. Can you tell us a little more about this? In 2005, the World Health Organization established what is called the International Health Regulations that governs the operations of countries in terms of ensuring that there are certain levels of capacity to respond to emergencies. Uh, previous to that, you had an old regulations that dealt with just six diseases. Okay. Among them would have been yellow fever, plague, and such. However, uh, it was thought that restricting international health just to six diseases was inadequate. And so the new international health regulations made provisions for diseases as well as other events that may constitute public health impact. And therefore, uh, these new regulations came into force in 2005, and the World Health, members of the World Health Assembly signed on to these regulations. Okay. Having done that, what essentially transpired is that uh, once St. Lucia signed on, it became an internationally binding piece of legislation. And St. Lucia was given a certain amount of time by which to ensure that the uh, requirements of the international health regulations were met within country. And therefore, they had annual reporting in terms of the progress that was being made by this country in terms of where we were in terms of implementing the provisions of the international health regulations. So all countries that are members of the World Health Assembly are guided by this piece of regulations. Okay. And um, with the coronavirus, um, we saw that the World Health Organization declared it a public health emergency of international concern. Can you tell us a little more about this? What does this mean? Right. So initially, when the coronavirus uh, was first touted around, mm -hmm. it was restricted to China. And the World Health Organization, they had a, a preliminary meeting and they discussed the pros and cons of that particular virus and how it was being transmitted and spread at the time. And the first um, decision that was taken by the World Health Organization is at the time was that they would not publish it as a public health emergency of international concern. However, when you begin to have spread of the disease, so it began to leave the borders of China and got into other countries, then there was a second meeting held by the World Health Organization. And they began to look at the pros and cons of the transmission of coronavirus and what it would mean for other countries. And then having looked at also the impact that the disease was having on China in terms of the number of persons that were getting sick, the number of people that were dying, along with the spread to other countries. It was then that the World Health Organization decided that they would declare a, a public health emergency of international concern. So what that really means is that uh, uh, coronavirus needed to have uh, um, an international response, not just mm -hmm. by China, but by other countries in the world as well. So in essence, when, when it was declared the public health emergency of international concern, countries now were to look at their own systems and to tighten up on the systems and to ensure that uh, they can respond to a case or cases of that disease and to ensure that capacities are implemented within countries. So there was a heightened awareness and preparedness that is required on behalf of countries to be able to deal with the advent of coronavirus in the specific country. And hence, the declaration was made. And subsequent to that, uh, there were different levels um, that was being flagged as to 
the risk to different okay. countries. And so at one time it was low risk. And now we have been told by the uh, World Health Organization that countries in the Caribbean, including St. Lucia, are at a high risk for getting an imported case. Uh, it means that somebody who is infected with coronavirus can come into your country. Mm -hmm. And therefore you need to heighten your preparedness for that eventuality. Okay, so that means definitely at this point in time, the countries around the world have to do more at the ports. That's correct. So not just at the ports, but within country to look at country's capacity, because the port is just one line of defense. But what about when people comes into your country? You're able to respond in terms of your quarantine measures at your hospitals, um, ensuring that you have uh, um, your your PPEs, pr personal protective clothing and equipment available, ensuring that you have systems in terms of being able to respond to a case. So it is not just points of entry, but to ensure that overall as a country, there is national preparation that is done to ensure that you are able to respond as a country. Wonderful. Well, we are due for a break. When we come back, we'll definitely continue this discussion. We will be back in a moment. Wash your hands. Wash them right. With soap and lots of water. Get between fingers. Get under the nails. Go above the wrists. Do this for no less than 15 seconds. Rinse properly. Dry with a clean towel. If there is no water, do the same washing motions with an alcohol-based hand sanitizer containing at least 70% alcohol. Wash your hands. Wash them right. This message brought to you courtesy the Bureau of Health Education of the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Welcome back. We will continue our discussion with Mr. Parker Ragnanen on the surveillance of coronavirus at the ports of entry. So if it's, in, if it's possible that you can tell us what provisions are put in place at the ports to actually conduct surveillance. Sure. St. Lucia, there are many ports of entry. We have two airports and we have a number of seaports. Mm -hmm. In 2014, the Cabinet of Ministers, looking at the situation um, when you were at the height of the Ebola scare at the time, uh, reviewed St. Lucia's procedures at the ports of entry and decided that they were going to designate two ports of entry for the provisions to ensure that the provisions of the international okay. health regulations were available, that is capacity to respond um, in the country because we recognize that based on the number of seaports that you have it was virtually impossible to have all the resources at each one of the seaports yeah. and that is why the decision was taken and communicated to the World Health Organization that there are two designated points of entry for international regulation purposes and these were the UNOR International Airport and the Castro Seaport. So there are two different methods of surveillance that is going on. The aircrafts um, flights are generally short um, coming into St. Lucia. Um, we have flights coming out of the U.S. that may be four hours, three hours, five hours, depending where you're from. Um, Canada, probably five hours, five and a half hours. The U.K., probably eight hours. So they are relatively short. What we rely on is information that is um, provided to us by the pilot through the airline agents. So if they pick up that there is a sick person on the aircraft, they would inform us, and it is when the plane is en route to St. Lucia. So it means that um, our capacity to respond mm -hmm. has to be very, very quick, because a plane may be two hours from landing when you are given information that there is a sick person on board that flight. So at, at the airports, what we have is we have nurses who are stationed at the spot to conduct surveillance of all incoming passengers. And uh, they do profiling. There are times they would, um, based on how a passenger presents himself at the, before they get to immigration, um, they would be pulled off and uh, triage, interviewed separately. Um, but given corona, what we do is we are very, very dependent on travel history. Travel history is what is important for us at this point in time. And therefore, we rely on information sharing with our other border control agencies. So immigration, for example, they have access to the advanced passenger tracking system. 
they also have uh, other ways of profiling people coming in through intelligence. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they are able to share with us information in advance of a plane landing into St. Lucia. We also have customs and immigration, and they too receive information. And therefore, we rely a lot on intelligence and sharing of information with our border control agencies, namely customs and excise and the immigration department. That is very, very important for us. We also have asked the immigration officers to vet the passports of people coming to St. Lucia carefully because people are mm -hmm. not always honest in terms mm -hmm. of indicating what they had visited within the last six weeks, the last three weeks. So we are concerned about where people have visited within the last 14 days for Corolla. So what we have asked our immigration counterparts to do is to screen the passport, vet it, and to look at what countries people have visited. Once anybody is picked up, even at that point of immigration, they are then referred to the nurses. Now, at the airports, what we have, we have uh, holding rooms that are separate and apart to everybody else. Um, so these suspect persons are taken to that room and oh. they would be examined further and questioned further. Great. Based on the findings of the nurse at that, at that port, then a decision would be taken as to whether the person is allowed to continue the normal route to get mm -hmm. clearance or whether they need special medical assistance and that is where the decision would be made and provided for. At the seaports you have uh, a different system. We rely on the ships that are coming to St. Lucia to submit what they call a maritime declaration of health. And the maritime declaration of health gives us a status of uh, the health of the passengers on board. And for St. Lucia, we have asked for a 24-hour advance submission of that document. And also, there is an updated version that is submitted when the ship comes in the morning and is asking for clearance. The Port Health Officer boards along with the Customs, Immigration, and the ship's agent, and then reviews that document, and a determination is then made as to whether to grant the ship clearance or not. If there are sick people on the ship generally, they are quarantined on board the ship in their room and are not allowed to come out uh, to be able to meet with our citizens and the public or to spread any infectious disease. Wonderful. And any final words before we go? Well, we just want to continue to assure the St. Lucian public that we are doing all possible. We do not want to come here and tell you that there is a 100% foolproof mm -hmm. system and nothing can come in, but we are doing the best that we can as possible to ensure the safety of all that is our citizens and visitors to St. Lucia. And we want to continue to work with you and you with us. If you have information that you'd like to share, please contact the Ministry of Health. Uh, it's 468-5300 if you need to transm transmit any information to us because we want to work together and collaborate as we continue to ensure there's a safer St. Lucia for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ragnar, for providing us with this information. It was very valuable. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's how we come to the end of interview, a production of the Government Information Service. On behalf of the entire production team, I am Fernal Neptune. Thanks for watching. We have been